Okay, so good afternoon. Okay, so this is again, uh, Sensei Jesse is really good, puts me on the spot where I have never done before is talking lecture for an hour, an hour and a half. Okay, it's very challenging. And I am not a scholar, I am not a, a historian, and, uh, but I will do my best to share what I know. Luckily, I'm from Japan and I have more resources of understanding not only the karate, but the, the budo and the Japanese culture. So I try my best to, to share what I know. But again, I, I don't like this one-way street thing. So if you have questions, uh, the things you uh, want to hear about, we can move around, okay? This is not fixed lecture, okay? Now, so before we go, Uh, <laughs> I just want to explain about the style. Let's see, I don't like the style, but in the, the kind of karate we practice, okay? We have different martial arts. Like yesterday, you did the Wing Chun, and some people practice Shitoryu, Uechiryu, and I practice Asai-style Shotokan. So I just wanted to explain what I do and how it's related to uh, the theme. Uh, Sensei Jesse said how the, the Chinese martial arts came to Okinawa, then Okinawa to mainland Japan, then went outside Japan again around the world, like UK or Sweden, or Germany, what so on. So what we have is JKA in Japan, which is the core of the Shotokan style. And as you know, it started by uh, Master Nakayama. He was a student of Gichin Funakoshi. And uh, Gichin Funakoshi is the person we call the father of modern day karate. He came from Okinawa in 1923 to Tokyo, initially to do a demonstration because there was a martial arts demonstration and he was invited. And why he was invited, what do you think? He was the karate master, there was another reason. Do you know? He spoke well. I'm sorry? He was a good speaker. Not only good speaker, he could speak Japanese. See, the, the, in the history, yeah, Okinawa has their dialects. Maybe you, I don't know about the British and the, it, you know, Irish, English, I mean, how different, I don't know. But the Okinawan language and, the, and Japan, mainland uh, Japanese, almost two different languages, okay? So there are several other karate masters came to uh, mainland Japan and they failed, not because their karate was bad, but because they could not communicate. You know, it's almost like uh, uh, if you are German and come to UK not you know, speaking English, it's very difficult to, to teach anything, yeah? So, uh, Master uh, Funakoshi was the teacher. Uh, I think it was elementary and junior high school teacher. So he was educated in that area. So he could speak standard Japanese. So he was chosen to go to Japan and to do the demonstration. And what's interesting is that, um, well, I'm diverting, so I wanted to talk about the Asai, but uh, I, I really want to talk about this uh, JK and the Shotokan thing first, so you can see the whole spectrum. And when the, he did the demonstration, there happened to be a very important, uh, very prominent Japanese person in the audience. And that was uh, Master Kano. And Master Kano is the founder of Kodokan Judo. Now Judo is around the world, right? And uh, Master Kano was a very prominent gentleman in uh, Japan at that time. He was a principal. He was uh, actually a member of International Olympic Committee. And he was representing Japan, tried to have uh, Olympics to Japan. And he will be very happy now that the karate is in the Olympics 2020, right? <laughs> but he was the person 
and he liked what he saw because his background was uh, jujitsu, and his idea was okay. Uh, Japan is changing from samurai to modern day world, so therefore killing and you know this kind of barbaric thing is going to be out of the uh, the time. So we should have more sports. What the European people are talking about sports. So he made ju jujitsu into judo without really you know uh, some dangerous techniques. So he dropped out kicking and punching and uh, just kept uh, choking joints and the throwing techniques, and that's what the judo is. But he was always looking for uh, other styles or other concepts to make his judo uh, a martial arts, even though it's going towards the sport. So he, when he saw Master uh, Funakoshi, he really wanted to have him to teach his high-ranking students. And the good thing and bad things happened here, and it really influenced the modern-day uh, karate. And of course, it had an influence into Storio too, and because the, the uh, Shotokan was the first organization after the World War II to have the tournaments, you know, which is JKA's tournaments. And that affected all the other uh, styles. But anyway, uh, so Funakoshi Sensei started uh, karate, and he always wanted to say karate. He did not want to have the style. And his students said Shotokan, but do you know what Shotokan means? Uh, right, Shoto was his yeah, pen name for his writing and poetry. But Khan came from Kodo Khan, the judo, right, influence. So the Khan is a house or the, the gymnasium, so that the places where they train and where the Shoto, which is the Funakoshi, was teaching, okay? So the influence from judo are prominent because he adopted some and he dropped some. He adopted the belts. We, we have pink belts now, <laughs> but in Okinawa, <laughs> They uh, practice without the top, okay? It's hot, so uh, they just practice with uh, regular pants. But, uh, you know, training in Japan, he uh, Funakoshi Sensei thought we have to be ja more Japanese. So he adopted the karate uniform, which Sensei Jesse sells, karate gi, <laughs> came from judo, yeah? So it's the same style, right? Just a different uh, material. So he adopted karate gi, karate belts, and also. I feel bad for Jack. <laughs> 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 yeah, Funako Sensei is uh, smiling now. <laughs> <laughs> and also the downgrading. Okay, in Okinawa there is no downgrading. Either you are a student or you are master, you know, teacher. There is no shodan ni dan samra. But because of the uh, the influence from judo, Funakoshi Sensei decided to adopt that, but he himself refused to take any ranks until he died. Yeah, so he wore the black belts, uh, but uh, he did not claim himself master, and he said he was only a teacher. But anyway, then those are the things that he adopted, and he also adopted a few other things, which is a kumite. Uh, in Okinawa, they only practice kata, and the teacher will teach bunkais. But basically, 90% of the time, you just practice kata, kata, kata. Okay? But uh, when the Funakoshi Sensei came to Japan, again, he didn't have a dojo. He was very poor, bec not because he was poor himself, but he basically retired his job in Okinawa and came to Japan on a voluntary basis. So when he wanted to do something, he could not get the job. So he was living in a dormitory, just like we're doing, almost like that, and he was teaching to the university students. So university students, young guys, 20 years old, they wanted to do more than kata, right? They wanted to do kumite. So the ideas of ju jitsu and the judo and the kendo idea got into karate, and now you have, you know, gohon kumite or ippon kumite, and in, you know, jiu kumite, 
which is around Dori in Judo. Okay? So they have the influence into the karate from the other Japanese martial arts. But for the uh, Shotokan people would be interested that uh, Funakoshi Sensei also <coughs> dropped a few things. One of them was the stance, <coughs> the Neko Ashidachi, which is prominent with the uh, Storyu and uh, you know Wechiryu. But uh, uh, Shotokan, unless you're going to a very high uh, rank uh, kata, like, uh, you know, Unsu, Neko Ashidachi is sort of dropped out and replaced with a back stance, okay? So that was because, from what I understand, is that he had to f fight or teach the uh, judo uh, practitioners. So the judo practitioner says, Okay, when you're doing the neko ashidachi, if I pull you like this, what would you do, okay? And because he did not want to embarrass the judo people, he could have kicked immediately, but he fought it out, and with the neko ashidachi, he couldn't. So he just went like this to pull back and made it into neko, uh, kokutsudachi. Because in the story, the kokutsudachi is like a zen kutsudachi looking back, right? Yeah, but ours is turned to hip, and this is it's basically neko ashidachi is elongated. Yeah? So there was a change in the, uh, the techniques itself. Okay? Then he was like 60 years old. So his son, in his late 20s and 30s, started taking over. And he was the one who started making the stances lower. Because if you look at the picture of Funakoshi Sensei, and even probably Mabuni Sensei, their stance is much higher, okay? But modern day karate, the people like it really low uh, for uh, the younger people. You know, they need to, to train on the legs and they are sort of moving away from uh, what we call bujutsu or martial art. Because for the martial arts, you have to be able to move, you know? And especially when you do the kata in the tournaments, you have to look good rather than, you know, whether it works or not. Even though, yeah, you, do, you have to do the bunkais and all. So there are some effects in this uh, coming from that movement. But anyway, so right after World War II, uh, two things happened with it, uh, Funakoshi Sensei's group. One is the people who wanted to do the hard style a lot of tension, and, and that was Funakoshi Sensei's son. And uh, unfortunately, Funakoshi Sensei's son passed away before the World War II. So Nakayama, who is the founder of JKA, took over. He became the chairman or chief instructor of JKA. Then there was another group, which was Egami Sensei, which is the, he was the, the founder of Shoto Kai, okay? And uh, they, sort of went to the other direction, more soft, longer stance, but the soft movement rather than uh, linear movements you see in uh, typical Shotokan. So it started in 1954, around that time, and then 1957, when Funakoshi Sensei died, JK started with the All Japan Championship. That was the beginning of the tournaments in Japan. And the 60s, Master Asai, who is the, the master that I follow, uh, became the students and the trainer uh, or instructor. And uh, he was dispatched to Taiwan because at that time, the JKA was sending, I think Storyu probably sent some people too, but the JKA was uh, main organization sending the instructors around the world promoting karate, right? Like, a, a, uh, and Eda Sensei came to UK, right? And Ochi Sensei went to Germany, and that type of thing. And Asai Sensei was sent to Taiwan, and he was practicing, you know, typical Shotokan karate for many years. Then when he went to Taiwan, he encountered White Crane Kung Fu, which is a short distance fight. Because JKA style is a long distance, long front stance, long punch, long kick, 
And uh, not as close as the Wing Chun, but the white crane fighting is a close distance fighting. So he f learned many techniques from that style. So he realized that JK karate is good in one way, but then missing something. So <coughs> he tried to combine those uh, techniques from white crane kung fu. So our style is a little different, but that was good yesterday that you had an exposure to uh, Chinese kung fu. And uh, so that the movements, short movements, this afternoon we practice with attention and the short distance, uh, the, the fighting style is seen in, in our style. That makes it a little difficult for the uh, standard uh, Shotokan people. Okay. But anyways, uh, so that was just a little introduction of what we practice. So we practice JKA, so if the people say, what is Asai Karate? Our foundation is uh, Nakayama founded JKA, Shotokan, but has an extension of Asai techniques. Okay, so the extension is short distance uh, techniques or, or, or stances. Like we, we use a lot of Neko Ashidachi for the short distance. We do a lot of elbows and close, uh, different type of uh, techniques. So that's the introduction of Asai Karate, okay? Then we went through this this morning. We emphasize three elements because we, th we think that your body has to be ready for Karate, right? So same thing as a, a Kenjutsu, you have to have a very good sword right? And uh, if it's only a paper sword, you cannot, you know, fight. So your body has to be trained to become a fighting weapon. Then that's one part. Then two is once you have that weapon, you have to be able to use it. So acquiring technique and using technique, two different things. And many times people just mix them up. But you have to think of them separately. Because when you first learn white belts, the yellow belts, whatever the belts, you have to do the basics very accurately. Everybody's saying, even tall and short, everybody has to do the same way, right? Because they're acquiring the technique, new technique for the first time. Then after that, you do this many, many times, teaching the body how to do it the correctly. So if you learn correctly first, it will be much easier. If you do it wrong or uh, inaccurate, then you will pay it, you know, later on. So therefore, it is very difficult, f say, even f between Shitoryu and the Shotokan, which is much closer than, say, Goju-ryu and uh, Shotokan. But if you try to become a Shotokan uh, practitioner, instead of just being both, it is very difficult for you to drop the technique you learn, right? Like, you know, you feel bent. Do you bend the, uh, the L, L, uh, wrist when you do knife and strike? Or straight? You do straight? Okay, because Shotokan we do straight too. But I've seen, you know, I do not know too much uh, story, so I am you know, if I'm wrong, please excuse me. But we had a student from Shitoryu in our dojo. And he said, no, we, they are taught, you know, this way. So his, his wrist was um, bent. And we tried to teach him, well, you got to go straight uh, here. And it was very difficult. And uh, so it's switching the once you learn technique is very difficult. Yeah. But uh, if you have to, you have to do so. When you learn something new, like today I said, you may have your own way, but please ask, please do what I ask you to do. Try my way and see how it works, right? But anyway, so there are three elements we talked about. One was flexibility. The second was balance, right? And third one, you love foundation <laughs> power, <laughs> mainly you know, legs, because that's the foundation, yeah? And uh, <coughs> talking about this foundation, 
we're talking about bipedal walking, we talked about. Because human being is the only uh, mammals that walk strictly on the, uh, the back legs. All the other animals, as you can see, four legs. Yeah, cats, dogs, horses, right? And it's much more balanced and, you know, secure. They don't fall down as easy as the boys and the, the babies when they try to walk. They have a problem, right, with the two legs. With the table, this table had only two legs. I think it will be very difficult to keep this standing, okay? So what it means is that we feel so natural with walking or standing with the two legs. And it's good and bad. You can do some complicated things. Like if you look at the Olympic, you know, they can do some amazing things. But at the same time, it is very difficult to keep balance, right? Which is good for us because when you're in martial arts, you are doing takedowns, yeah? It's very easy in a certain directions. You have very unbalanced uh, stance. So it's easy to off balance and easy to throw, okay? And uh, at the same time, I, I believe I mentioned that a lot of times we think that generating power, you stand and try to do, but actually if you're in motion, you can learn to keep the balance and generate power more, yeah? That is a different concept I uh, learned from Masai Sensei, and he's very quick motion and showed us how, okay? And we will do some tension this afternoon, okay? And also uh, with the tension, we will do the takedowns, okay? Some ideas. Okay, so uh, I wrote down several things. I have my cheat sheets here. And I have some uh, important, you know, subject I, I'd like to share with you. But up to now, a little bit of history, uh, you know, it's some people say, oh, it's not important because, you know, we practice in this. That's also important, which is okay. But it's also, I think it will be good for you how the, you know, this is the theme of uh, this weekend, how the, the karate came in this the journey and, and uh, uh, changes for you guys. So you can see, maybe if you wanna go back and try to pick up what's lost or you can sort of predict how you wanna do, right? But if you have any questions or anything that you would like to, uh, should be interactive. So do you have anything you wanna say like, oh, I'm, you're putting me to sleep or, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, I cannot answer the question because I do not know about the, uh, too much about the Goju Ryu. And uh, uh, if he practiced uh, white crane kung fu, must be similar. But uh, it's not like Shitoryu and Shotokan. They are pretty much defined the style. But the, the Chinese style, because of the population and the history is much longer, even white uh, crane kung fu has different lineages, right? Starting from same, but the breakdown. And uh, yeah, same thing with the other, like a, um, a Wing Chun. They even have two or three already. And the story, I think, is sort of breaking too, right? But so in Chinese style, they have even more. So I cannot say if it's the same lineage or not, okay? But one thing I know the history is that I was, th you know, I was thinking, how come did he learn that in Taiwan? You know, why didn't he go to mainland China? But what happened is, during the World War II, the the communist China, which has the power now, chased the uh, the other national uh, group, and they had to escape to Taiwan. So there are a lot of mainland people moved to to Taiwan, and along with those people, the the, the the Kung Fu 
masters because they were not, you know, you know Mao Tzu during the, the big culture thing that he says you can't practice, you know, Kung Fu or Tai Chi and all this happened, right? So that kind of thing happened. So all those Kung Fu uh, masters escaped, maybe not all because I'm sure some left, but the many of them escaped to Taiwan in 1945 and, and 46, that's that time. So that's why they have a really good lineage, Kung Fu uh, <coughs> masters lived in Taiwan. And uh, he, he said he was very lucky to, to practice this and uh, combine you know, long distance, which is very you know, good system, but lacking or missing, drop the, uh, the short distance. Yeah. Okay. Oh, let me uh, main screen could say since you have the only other one I know of the Kapu is the uh, Uncle Tak Do you have any others? Yeah, um, this is what happened. <coughs> Here again, it's a little history. What he learned, I mean, he knew 150 katas, okay? And it, uh, it's amazing. I learned, you know, typical JK does 26 kata, and I learned another 26, so I know 52. And I think that's more than enough. I can't remember all those. But he knew 150. That's why I call him a genius. And so he knew so many katas. He created many. And his styles are different. Therefore, he was basically kicked out of JKA, even though he was a technical director in the 80s when Nakayama, who was the first chief instructor, was in power. And he was thinking, Okay, Asai is so good, maybe he will be the next, but he was still young. Then Nakayama had a heart attack and died too soon, basically, before the transition happened, this happened. So they had other senior instructors and uh, the f you know, they had a breakup. So they had to leave. So, but the, what happened, unfortunately, is from 1990 to 2010 years, so almost 11 years, they had a court f fight, so there were, to JK organization, Asai, and also original, right, uh, Tanaka group. So during that time, that th they could not really teach Asai Ryu Karate, because they're thinking it's going to be a JK, JK syllabus and all this. Then 2000, they lo uh, Asai group lost. Therefore, he decided to make new organization called JKS, right? Right now, Kagawa Sensei is the chief instructor. So 2000 is the time he really started to teach his style of karate. He didn't care whether people say, oh, that doesn't look like a JKA. So the history is short, and he died 2006. So he only has six years to really promote. Not enough time to really create many miniature asai. And Andre Battelle is from New Zealand. So he, asai sensei used to go to New Zealand. So there are few people in New Zealand and only few people around the world who is really uh, protocol. I am not call myself an expert in it because I only knew him five years because I started with him 2001 and he passed 2006. So only five years I learned the katas, but the foundation is the same. He was the chief instructor of, uh, um, technical instructor of uh, JKA, so we have the same foundation. So this top area uh, I learned for five years. But not too many people could do what Master Asai could do. So that's the reason we don't have too many Asai style. Actually, when this split happened, uh, Sensei um, Yahara and Sensei Abe and Sensei uh, Yamaguchi, who passed, that's a Yamaguchi senior, but he, he died. So they are all together for 10 years, and after the court, they lost, so they also broke apart, right? So um, Yahara Sensei has his own organization, and Abe Sensei has his own whole split. Uh, he was in the same organization, but Kagawa Sensei, if you look at his karate, he is strictly JK style. And he is also into very much in sports, and he's very successful because he was one of the key members to bring uh, JFK into the Olympics. 
And he is really the chief instructor of this Olympic committee. And uh, he's not uh, a very senior person. I mean, he's still in his 50s, and yet he's very powerful in Japan. And he's really into tournaments. And uh, so he's not very much interested in doing Budo part. He's more trying to make karate successful through uh, Olympics. So that's a different route. You know, I respect that route. Uh, but unfortunately, he did not really follow Asai Sensei's style. See, that's why I resigned from JKS, because you can tell that the organization is going from Asai style to more into Kagawa style. Yeah, it was different from what I was looking for. Yeah. Okay, so a couple other things. <coughs> uh, we talk about self-defense. Okay, so when we talk about, okay, what is self-defense? Okay, yeah, when I'm out, out in the bar, somebody comes and tries to hit me, I can block, I can... Okay, that is the self-defense too. But I feel that most of the people missing the flip side of the coin. To me, that flip side is more important. And what do you think that flip side is? Put yourself fighting in against your wife? No. <laughs> don't, don't put yourself in a situation where you need to use the skills? Okay, well, but that's still the same side. Fighting against somebody, right? What happens after? What happens after? Uh, <laughs> but that's still fighting <laughs> after. Is it understanding your enemy's mentality? Okay, but you're still on the same side. <laughs> what I wanted to say is your biggest enemy is you. That's the side I wanted to tell you. Okay, so who has like, oh, I have you know, hay fever every year and I have headache in the springtime or I catch cold at least once a, once a year or I was in car accident last year or I fell down from the uh, steps and hurt my knees. You see, that's the side I consider. Getting into a fight and defending your life in some area may happen, but it will not happen every week, okay? It could happen once in your lifetime. Of course, we need to be ready. That's why we're practicing this, and I'm not lighting that, right? But, you know, you, you don't want to get sick. You don't want to get into a car accident. You don't want to be caught by a police and get a ticket, okay? Self-defense, self is you, defense against injury, sickness, okay? And I'm not bragging, but I haven't been to a doctor the last 30 years. I just don't get sick, okay? And I think it has lots to do with the karate. My immune level is very high, so I don't get um, hay fevers, or I go to India, I drink water, I don't get sick. I go to Mexico, I drink water, and I don't get sick. I can eat just about, you know, what the local food. So I'm very lucky in that. So they say, oh, it's your genes. Yeah, maybe when I was young, but I'm 69, so it's me. And it's practicing karate, breathing correctly, eating right. We talked about not drinking Coke, <laughs> not using sugar and salt, right? And that is the self-defense I consider as important. Uh, what do you eat? What kind of diet do you have? Uh, basically, salad and soup is my main. Vegetable. I am not a vegetarian, so if there is a chicken, that's fine. But usually I don't eat the red meat. Yeah, so like my lunch, like last week was the uh, milkshake, milk with uh, uh, the fruits, you know, in a blender. And with a little, uh, like a protein powder in there. That's my lunch. And the nighttime is either salad or the soup. But if we have something else, I also eat, but not too much of uh, red meat. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's what I wanted to present to you. When we think about self-defense, self-defense, look at yourself and say, okay, <coughs> you know, maybe I can save myself more often if you drive carefully, right? If you drive with <laughs> driving like, it's dangerous, right? So don't use a cell phone when you're driving, okay? And you have to look, so make sure you don't get tickets by police. 
I got many because in Brazil, they have those hidden cameras, which I did not know. I got, I got 11, <laughs> 11 tickets, right? Was it 11 tickets? Yeah. Oh my God, I could not see, right? So you have to be careful, yeah. But uh, yeah, the police, I haven't been stopped for, I don't know, 20, 30 years, yeah. So that's self-defense. Anything you want to talk about this before we go to the next one? No? All right, okay. All right, so the next one is we talk about, especially Shotokan, we talk about power because we call kime, right? <coughs> and the speed, and that's important. Speed and power, of course it's important because if it's like this punch, you cannot knock somebody. But we, what we have to do is um, we think about the power in an incorrect way from my perspective, okay? Because what it says, oh, show me the muscle, they go like this, right? And this one is not doing anything because, yeah, the muscle is up, but it's actually doing no work, right? And the pulling, okay, like in judo, they think it's strong. But the karate is not pulling, in other words, it's not contraction, okay? What is missing is expansion of the body is karate. Of course, there are some contraction, okay? But mainly because of the Western world likes this power in a different way, and that influence, you know, is coming into the martial arts. So it's a strong guy, or oh, he must be strong, right? But actually, this, the speed and the power come from expansion, and it is more difficult. Tensing and relaxing. Everybody knows relaxing is important, but everybody, when you have some examination coming up or something, you tense. The neck get stiff or back stiff, okay? So expansion, and the muscles does only one thing. Muscle can only ex uh, contract. Muscle does not extend. Right? You know, right? Can only contract. Uh, how do you do this? Is you have to pull the other ones to extend it. Yeah? Because this is the contraction. And you have to relax, right? Because if you tense on both sides, and this is what happens, you see this, you know. <laughs> but this means you learn how to tense, relax. Yeah? Tense, relax. That's what you can do. But it's more of uh, expansion, okay? More of expansion is the karate rather than pulling. So jujitsu, uh, you probably practice tomorrow. More of a grappling is more contraction work. Yeah, I'm not saying <coughs> which is better. I'm not talking about saying which is better. Just we need to know the body mechanism right, to be able to execute your technique. Because if you tense, you cannot punch or kick. More relax, more relax, yeah, we talk about. Because of that reason. So we're saying, don't put the, the foot on the gas pedal and the brake pedal at the same time, right? Stop, just let it go, relax, okay? So that's the mechanism, okay? <coughs> and then, uh, I would always uh, ask the, uh, in my seminar, do we have the basic knowledge of uh, anatomy? Okay, because we look at ourselves and we're same, covered with the skin, but we have a very uh, sophisticated mechanism in yourself, you know? So very simple, uh, uh, knowledge such as how many, I'm not, see this is not a medical school, so I'm not going to ask you a precise number, but how many muscles in our body do you think we do? And of course it's difficult because defining the muscle, because they're all connected, okay, but the medical people say you have, you know, like this is tricep means three, biceps means two, right? 
So those muscles, how many do you think we have? I think this is as a karate instructor you need to know. Not because you ain't going to dissect or anything, but okay. Are uh, we built on, uh, just like this, if you are uh, racing a car, right? You know inside out of the engine. You know anything about the brake pad. You know everything. If you're in a professional speed racer, right? We are the professional karate guy. We need to know what we are made of. And if you don't know, okay, you know, maybe you need to do. So how many? Do we have only 10 muscles or do we have 10,000? You have to have some idea. Anybody? You mean total or what we use? Uh, total. Oh. <coughs> what we are consisted of. <laughs> what we use, we use only two. <laughs> we use a lot of here. <laughs> 255? Huh? 255. Mm, no. Believe me, you are more sophisticated than 50, 60. 157. <laughs> Bad guess, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you went to medical school, okay, you're, you're excused on that. Ah, not that many, <laughs> sorry, sorry, you went. Uh, depending on how you, uh, you know, define, and whether you, there are many, many uh, small muscles in your face, right, because of your face expression. They say 650 to 850, about, okay, 650 to 800. So around 60, 600, 700, 800. Quite a few muscles. You move them, okay, including like the heart. You have no control. Heart is pumping itself. But most of the muscles, uh, other than the internal, organs, you know, you can, you can move, right? Legs and arms, okay? So that's one. How about the bones, okay? You don't have only one bone, right? It's, you have... <laughs> Are you just guessing and <laughs> throwing the number? <laughs> Very good, okay. When you're born, 350, they say, but uh, as you grow old, you know what happens? Your the, the uh, scalp uh, bones, okay, they were all apart when the baby, you can see, right, this, but they will touch, so they decrease. So it's a little over 200 bones, okay, the different kinds, the pieces. So you have 200 different pieces of hard, okay, parts in your body with a 500 to 600, 700 <coughs> muscles, they're connected, because if you have one bone, you need to have two different uh, muscles, right? Okay, so then how many joints do you think? Like uh, this is joint, this is a joint, these are joints. How many joints do you think we have? Yeah, if you want to include them, uh, yeah, uh, because I'm going to come back to spine later. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Huh? More than. That's why I say you have to write it down because I'm going to give you an examination after this. Huh? We are more sophisticated than this. Again, it's difficult to say because some parts, you know, some count and don't count. But they say 230 joints. Right? We usually think about, okay, joints, 10, 20, 30. But look at the rib cage, all these things. Your rib cage moves, right? And they, they have all kinds of joints, okay? Now, so thank you very much for talking about spine, okay? Or backbone we talk about. We think about like one big bone. But they, these are connected with various different bones, vertebrates. How many bones do you think we have in this? This is probably one of the most important bones in your system for karate, because that's where you generate the power, right? This backbone. How many? I'm sorry? 50. Uh, that will be like, uh, like an irrigator. No, I, I, no, it's less than that. 
that's close. Yes. So it's it's uh, they talk about um, 24, okay, and you have seven in the neck. The, what do you call that? I'm not too good. At cervix. This yeah, it's seven, and the the the, the chest area is 12. Okay, the lumbar area is five. Then you have the bottom, the, the bottom of the spine and the tail bones. Okay, so but the point is you don't need to you know remember like whether it's twenty four or twenty six or twenty seven. But the point is it's not just the one bone, but they are like connected, and it's like a really like a magical things that sh move sideways, front and back, rotates all these things, yeah? And that's how we are created. And you have to keep that, you know, when we talk about flexibility, right? Not only the, the hip joints or the shoulder, but the backbone is very important, okay? So I would like for you to remember that part, saying, oh, okay, that's, you know, I need to work on. All right, so we have a very sophisticated the mechanism, and I'd like for you to think about this. <coughs> you know, maybe you think like a jet fighter, you know, have thousands of parts and very sophisticated, but our body is much more. Because think, 500, 600 muscle means they move. It's almost like the, the jet plane with a 500 engines, you know, moving, yeah? Therefore, the flip side is, we know, to be able to manage all these different muscles and joints, 230 joints, and the bones, is not easy work, yeah? That's why we have to practice many times, yeah? So understanding what to do, then we call repetition, yeah? So that repetition ingrains into your body, so that it comes out just like Bruce Lee says, don't think and feel, right? To be able to feel, you, your body has to know without thinking, yeah? So that's the process with very sophisticated uh, mechanism we have. And that's the point I wanted to bring to you. <coughs> Any comments or questions or you wanna share? Very quiet. Oh. I'm falling asleep. For such different meditations through your training throughout the year. I don't know if this would be the appropriate time for anything is appropriate. So <laughs> you're talking about meditation? Yeah, or breathing methodology that you use. Yes. <coughs> That's a very good point. Thank you very much. Breathing. <laughs> it's a very interesting mechanism in your body. Okay? Because heart you have no control. Right, it just, okay? The muscles here, it moves only when you will it. Breathing is the only mechanism that you can control while you're awake. When you sleep, it goes into automatic, right? It's not like a heart. When you are you know, awake, you have to keep it running and sleep, then automatic, no, it's just automatic all the time. Breathing has two aspects. And ancient Chinese and Japanese people realized this interesting part, and they incorporated the breathing training method, you know, uh, practice into what we call Zen or meditation. And what I do is <coughs> I make it long, okay? So do you know how many times you breathe a minute? Do you calculate it yourself? How many times? You do how many times? 20. Oh, <laughs> it's a little too short. Yeah, a lot of people do 10, 15, okay? What you want to do is you want to make it long, okay? And I go for two times a minute. That means my breathing is 15 seconds out 15 seconds in, so the one cycle is 30 seconds, okay? So that's when you're talking about when I'm meditating or when I'm doing the, um, 
driving. I do the breathing um, exercise when I'm driving. And uh, the reason is because of that slowness will slow down your heartbeat. So I can control my heartbeat, not completely directly, but you know, by way of breathing, because if you breathe very fast, okay, your heart will pump faster. When the sick persons, have you seen the sick people go, <laughs> okay, and their heartbeat is very high, okay? So they say that uh, in your lifetime, there is a certain number of the heartbeat before you die, right? So you're burning up your heartbeat. So you want to make your heartbeat slower, okay? That will give you a calmer mind, okay? Works on your, in a nerve system in a different way, okay? And then that also increases your, believe it or not, your immune system. And when you're nervous, you're on a risk. You are calm, confident, and peaceful. And that's when your immune system is promoted, right? So that goes back to that self-defense or defending yourself. So having that breathing, one thing, as I mentioned, is make it longer, yeah? Breathe in long, short and long, and sh breathe out short, uh, long, not short. And if you can make it into 15, 15, that's, that's great. Because those Zen monks, they try to breathe only one a minute, 30 seconds in, 30 seconds out. That's pretty hard. But I'm sure if you practice a little, 15 seconds and 15 seconds in, can be done. And uh, if you cannot try for like a three breathing cycle per minute, that's 20 seconds, right? 10 seconds out, 10 seconds in. Your own flexibility this morning was very impressive. I was just wondering, other than the, the drills that you were showing us, what other things do you do sort of on a daily basis to maintain that level of flexibility? And just practice. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, it, are there lots of other exercises where you know, you'll see? Yes, we have, more than, yeah, we have more than 150 different exercises. And I exercise between three to five hours daily every morning. I start around 8 o'clock, either 12 or 1 o'clock. I train every morning. And when I take a break, I'm on the Facebook, right? <laughs> so when I'm talking to you, oh, I have to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I have 20 to 25 uh, syllabus in a, in a day. I have basically two sets. And I, I do about 50. Yes. A different exercise, uh, yeah. In, you know, the sometimes I want to do kata when I oh, I forgot that. Okay, I practice. But sharpening my sword, yeah, is the main thing. Yes. Right. Now, another thing with the breathing related is when you tense, do you breathe in or breathe out? <laughs> Most of the times, because yeah, out, right? Because you do kiai, right? Yeah. Out. <laughs> okay? So reverse it. Okay? When you practice, reverse this. When you put the power, breathe in. <laughs> and you can make kime breathing in instead of breathe out. Okay? So when you do the kata, reverse the breathing. And that will be a good exercise for you. It's because it teaches that you have a different way of using your, the lung muscles, right? And that will also help you develop the diaphragm, which is controlling this lung area. So when you do sit-ups, yeah, when you are contracting, you breathe in. <sighs> when you expand, you exhale. And uh, you move that diaphragm. Actually, there are two diaphragms. One here, the one on the bottom. Okay? That diaphragm is suspending your internal organs from going into your legs. So, th yeah, so you need to exercise on those both diaphragms, you know, up here. 
and this is for the breathing. Yeah. So that's something you can do is incorporate uh, breathing into your kata. And in Shotoka, unfortunately, we only have Hangetsu <coughs> kata, Seishan. It directly, you know, breathing in. <sighs> you know, that's only one kata. And uh, I tell them that, I tell my students that you can incorporate that to almost any kata, paying attention to the breathing and coordinating with the movements. Yeah. Right. <coughs> three, minimum three different ways. Okay, so like when you do here, breathing in is one. Or you can do breathe out. Or in and out. So just three different ways. Right. It's one thing is you is like one movement is breathing. That's one way. What yeah. is the there is no one right. There is just different way of breathing. Yeah, because you need to be able to generate power. Because from the, the martial arts perspective, uh, you have to be able to defend yourself. Because a lot of times, when you are inhaling, and if you get hit, you you get more shock than exhaling tight, right? But you have to be able to do this even when you are inhaling, that you can make kime, meaning tense your body. You can do that. You have to be able to do this at any time. You have to train yourself so that you can generate whether you're inhaling or exhaling or holding. A lot of white belts they hold, right? <laughs> they say, oh, "Come on, breathe, breathe." You know, they don't know how to control, so they hold it, right? But now you guys are practicing long time so you're breathing but still if you train long time you're holding and your face get red but if you train this with a, a consciousness to your breathing you can train longer and you do not get tired like a professional say like a marathon runner okay they can run two hours of full speed you know and they can do this so even though the karate is a short time-wise short distance fighting because you're not going to fight 15 minutes like in kung fu movie right it's basically somebody is there you one hit and the other guy drop or you drop it's short but you have to be able to practice you know two hours without getting too tired if you relax more you will be tired less if you are tense you're using the unnecessary muscles and and energy yeah so tomorrow morning, if you have, you know, <laughs> so like you use the wrong muscles too much. Yeah. One question. If you inhale this cut uh, in the beginning, um, do it slowly or do it fast? Or okay, so you're getting more <laughs> technical very detailed. part. No, again, you can do different ways. That's why I said there are only th uh, three basic ways but within those three you can do fast and you can do slow and the slow is better because it takes longer to breathe in right now breathing in time <coughs> be sure to breathe through your nose do not breathe in from your mouth but when you breathe out you can breathe out through your nose and the mouth out is okay okay in time nose don't so when you're training do not <laughs> when you get tired so make sure keep your mouth lightly closed breathing in through your nose so you know when the you know white belts get tired we say do a ki ai ki because that forces them to get the air out right right but then again uh you know uh uh, Goju Ryu practice, um, you know, their breathing method, and they are like a uh, little sharp, you know. <sighs> we call ibuki, right? 
And I don't know if you practice Ibuki breathing in Ashtoryu. You do, okay? So that's like a tension of the stomach. 100% now. <laughs> and you practice that. Have you started uh, training hundreds? You found out that there are maybe 10 different ways you can, different ways of breathing in, inside this skull. Right. Yes. It's very interesting. But there's no literature, no standard. Right. Do it like you want. Right. So the main purpose of hangetsu is lost, right? Sort of lost. I mean, there are some people know. And I don't know if you're familiar with the, the uh, Shotokan's hangetsu. Their you know, stance looks like a front stance, but the knees is really caved in. And that is incorrect. <coughs> because this is a tension of inner thighs and the lower stomach. Then if you look at the Funakoshi Sensei's picture, his legs is straight. But they forgot this is coming from breathing. So that's what they do is they bring the knee in so they think that this is the tension, but it's actually it's incorrect. And it's not good for the knees. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. Different kiais. Right, there are different kiais. But in Okinawa time, there was no kiai. No kiai whatsoever, because they're prohibited to practice karate. And can you imagine doing kiai? Oh, there is a guy, <laughs> karate guy, go get him. No, you had to practice. They practice in the graveyard. First of all, there are no dojo. They practice either the backyard uh, or in the grave so that nobody comes at night. So they practice at night. And in the graveyard and saying, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, so no kiai. They did practice no kiai, but then they had to do the tension. So we, I call silent kiai. No sound, right? No sound, but air comes out. And that's what they practiced. But because of this tournament, they had to say, okay, we should have two kiai. So here you have to kiai. If you don't kiai, minus five point. But that is artificial. Yeah, so Kiai in the tournaments came 1950s, the concept. Because if you read uh, uh, Karate Do Kyohan, he wrote sometimes Kiai here, but one kata, you know, he missed one Kiai, right? So Kiai is not that important from that perspective. At your black belt level, if you miss a Kiai, that's okay. If you're making Kime, you can do this without making sound. I heard that Harada Sensei. He is a Shoto Kai. Shoto Kai. He's doing the old Kiai. Right. Because he's coming from uh, the old school. <laughs> and uh, Nihiyama, he, he, he teached us three different Kiais. This very deep half, this very high, like Ai, like Katana, and the long, deep Kiai, very long, of two or three techniques. But is it necessary? I can answer to that one because I don't consider Kiai yeah, that important. <laughs> what well, they do also doing Kiai, right? Yeah. If you do fighting. Yeah, Kiai <coughs> is, if I can generate power, I don't have to make sound. If the guy is down, why you have to do it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> down. So I don't need the Kiai. But again, uh, when you're teaching, maybe you may have a different uh, concept on that. You know, teaching the beginners, you may have to have that. Yes. Okay. All right. So that's. Thank you very much for the, the uh, breathing. Uh, you yeah, and uh, you say there's some problems to the PI. Is PI a way to let you uh, go? To let you uh, go? No, you don't want to let the key go. You have to want to. You want to keep the key inside. You don't want to let it go. Yeah. But because of this uh, a wrong concept of key showing this, you have to let it go and fill the, the dojo with your key. It's already filled with a key, but you have to keep inside of yourself. And you only generate the energy to the target. Only energy. Transfer the, the punching power or kicking power. Mm -hmm. Right.
uh, as I say, normally your pathology that we uh, connect back to the breathing part. How early do you start to teach your students how to breathe the correct? Is it very early in the training, or do you wait until they get a little bit higher grade, such as uh, third Q or first Q? When when do in your method when it's appropriate to start to teach your students to breathe correctly? Yeah, that's a good question, but it's, a, it's also a very difficult one because when you say students, it's just like a student, but is he six-year-old or is he 20-year-old or 60-year-old? You know, it depends, right? So kids, you don't go into breathing too much. I mean, they cannot conceptually understand what you're talking about. But if you have some senior person who practice soccer or swimming, they know about the physical things, you know, you want to explain earlier, you can. Especially the beginners, you tell them, you know, you have to breathe in and out, don't hold the breath. But if you tell them, relax, yes, I'm relaxed, you know, they don't understand. So what do you do when they're ready to understand this, right? So as you said, 3Q, when they become brown belts, they should know by then but you should be telling them before that time. But here again, until they can do their body, that they may understand a little, but they cannot, you know, do. But they need to understand, right? So breathing is important. And uh, it, it, is, it, it is a very important part, and they should be taught on that. Mm. But again, same thing with the bunkai. I have many people ask me bunkai, when should I start teaching bunkai? You know, the, the white belts, we tell them do this, this, and this. If they don't know what the heck they're doing, they think it's a dancing. No. Well, my answer is maybe different from the other people. If they, kn if they know what it is for, it might not be a good thing for them because they think all oh, the punches come in there for this, right? So you think maybe it might be a good idea, but maybe it's not because you want to move the body. It may not be applicable in a real fight, but you need to learn correct body mechanism, right? Like why do you come here? You know, it's a punch, why don't you go like this? But you go like this, you know, at least in Shotokan we learn like this, right? So until they have this movement, maybe they don't really need to know because if they try to apply, oh, the guy is tall, so, you know, they're short. You have to have one method or basic technique. Then you can apply to 10 million different uh, situations because bunkai could be many, right? Because opponent could be tall, short, two, three, five, six, and the guy might throw punches in a different ways, kick, whatever, you don't know. Right? You may be perfect in the bunka in the kata, but out in the streets, it's a different story. I've seen the picture showing, <coughs> you know, the iceberg, the small top with a big one, and they say like kata and bunka, <coughs> right? Have you seen this picture? Kata here and bunka is big. My feeling is bunka is small and reality is much bigger than bunka, you know? Because, so you say, well, well, there are 10 million different ways or infinity number of bunkais you cannot practice, right? Now, how do you do this? If you know how to move your body, right? Not how because of this or this or that, without the condition, if you know how to move your body, then you can apply. You have to get to that level, which is very difficult. So you, you should practice bunkai to learn how those different techniques, you know, what is this for? Like, you know, why the hand is here, like uh, in a basai, right? What is this for? You know, pushing the hand, you know, they say supporting the, the hand. No, it's not. This means that you're blocking and hitting or something like that. It's good to know, but it could be different meanings. So don't get trapped in a certain bunkai, but at the same time, you should know bunkai Sounds like a Zen talk. But I'm missing a little bit. I must be careful to uh, say this. Uh, we had different, in the, yesterday we, we learned different distances. Mark, so far, medium, 
Ukraine. But in Bukai, this systematization um, is very difficult. Systematization, which says, okay, Bunkai one to one, like in the kata, Bunkai for the street, Bunkai between, where you change angles and movements. So this systematization is uh, not fixed or not written down. But if you use this systematization, you can enlarge for each kata, you can enlarge every sequence in three different ways, and then you can do uh, technique like as an as uh, attack, as a defense, as a take down and then you enlarge again. So that's the reason why Kunka can be a very wide range. Yeah, so think about the language, right? <coughs> like when you first learn, say, English, and you go into UK, London, and you don't know what they talk to you. You cannot, or if he says good morning, you can say a good morning. But if he says, where are you from? And if you don't know that one, <laughs> you don't know how to answer back. It's like a free spot. You don't know what the other person is going to ask you. But you have to practice how are you. Oh, I'm fine, thank you, and you. <laughs> you know, and there's always in the Japanese uh, English book says, this is a pen. But I never use <laughs> this is a pen <laughs> as a book. Is this a pen? Yes, it is. You know? <laughs> but you practice this, right? So the karate thing is like you never use this in a street fight, but you have to practice. Yeah. So bunka is a very interesting subject. We can talk over a glass of wine. Let's <laughs> <laughs> what is your opinion of uh, makiwara in training ah. makiwara? Oh, you must be studying. Uh, you know the history of makiwara, by the way? No. By my book. No. OK, so Okinawa was occupied by Satsuma clan of southern Japan uh, in 17th, 18th centuries. Okay, And in Satsuma, if you if you are in Kenjutsu, you know they have Jigen Ryu. That's the Kenjutsu style, okay? And their style is that they they practice with a wooden sword, and they have a bunch of uh, woods tied up, but it's lined up this. They do is beat the shit out of this thing, yeah, yeah and a lot of kiai. So you can tell that this lineage came to Okinawa. Kiai as they hit, and they hit. And not to you know toughen up the, of course, because they have a sword. But the one punch, they say one, you know, like a one slice, one kill. It's like a one punch, one kill. It's same concept. And so that concept hitting the wood came to Okinawa. And instead of the punching, so they made it into you know uh, the current day makiwara. And my thing is, <coughs> why we have makiwara in Shotokan, Storyu, Goju Ryu is because in our Kumite time, it's non contact, right? Even though well, we are same contact, but this is nothing. You don't knock somebody and get the teeth flying out. So you have to practice to get this feeling of actual hitting. Nowadays, we have punching bag, so punching bag is good. But before and says, you know, you gotta put the hip in and get the power. Okay, in a way, for the beginner, for me, the beginner, meaning like to show them people, okay, get that feeling. But as I mentioned to you, you will be most balanced and you can generate speed and power when you're moving, not when you stop. So when you become advanced students, you can practice makiwara as you're moving instead of punching like this. You move to punch, like you know you do boxing with the the uh, uh, bags. Okay, not to punch strong, but the timing and also the distance. But the makiwara is just one flat. It's more difficult, so the bag, you know, heavy bag, is probably better. I don't use makiwara. I used to, but I. But it's okay if you practice and get the feeling, so the connection. Né? Because if this is down, you hurt your wrist, right? So in actuality, that the, that this is sort of curved up, yeah. So getting the connection to the shoulder by punching is okay. What do you think about tamashiba? I'm sorry? Tamashibari. 
あ、試し割り。試し。試し。試し。いや、試し割り。いや、試し割り。Uh, 試し割り is okay.、Uh, if you have a lot of money, so you can break a lot of boards.、Uh, it's okay. But once again,、uh, you can break a brick or, you know, big ice cubes. You see that in demonstration, right? But they don't punch you back. Bruce Lee said the same thing. So you can break, so what? Because I've seen so many times that it doesn't take much power to knock somebody.、Okay? As long as that person thinks that you're getting hit, he can sustain. Like when you're stepping down the st steps and you thought that was the end, like at night, but there was one more, <laughs> you know the feeling, like well, <laughs> not expecting, right? So when you get hit, when you're not expecting, so when you are not. Like eyes closed or something, and when you receive a light connection, the person just clambers, you know. Yeah. So, what you have to do is you have to, you know, like we did not do too much today, make them, like, you know, Jesse says it was, you know, okay, diversion, you know, cover the eyes, make him close the eyes. That's very important. Close eyes so cannot see when it's going to hit. It's much, you will have much more. Impact, you don't need to really have a brutal force to strike.、Yeah. So, Tameshwari is okay to see if you can generate enough, you know, as, as a, you know to, to check, but that's not something you want to do every week or even every month. For demonstration, it's okay, impress somebody, but so what? Okay? Because if I want to break this、uh, big brick, I bring my hammer. <laughs> it's much easier <laughs> instead of. <laughs> All right, good.、Um, we got some more time. I have a few more things here.、Uh, there are a couple other <coughs> information.、Uh, one is in Okinawa time, the biggest difference what happened was 19th century, right? 19, or, uh, uh, let's see, no, I could be wrong.、Uh, yeah, 20th century, 1900, right? When karate became public. Until that time, karate was taught only from one sensei to possibly one or two, okay, not more than two students. So it was like a direct teaching, like a private lesson, you know. And,、uh, but then, you know, with the 19th, 20th century, it says, oh, we have to make karate more public. We don't want to keep it secret. So, Ito Sensei invented you know, Pinyan and so that the elementary school kids can practice.、Okay? So, but before that time, there were no names for each technique. s Believe it or not, you say, oh, get down by eyes, soto uke, age uke, right? Chiu dan zeki. No, no terms. Sensei will say, okay, do this, do that, this way. He comes this way, this way, that way, this way. Okay, no names. So, okay, so when you're teaching a large number of students, you needed to know what do you call this? Okay, soto uke. What do you call this? Shito uke, okay. But the problem is that you think this is shito uke. But more than 50% of the time, this is striking. It's not the shito uke. Uke is block. When we say, oh, this is age uke. So you think this is age uke, it's down,、uh, rising block. But actually, it isn't. I don't know, in a pinyan, nidan, after the gedan bai, you bring this hand, then go age uke, right? Three times. Is it the same? Heian shodan in n o w s Pinyan is nidan. Yeah? Funako s e n s e flip that, right? So,、um, So that is the technique. This is the rising block. This is getting this chin up, right? Blocking. So it's a simple technique. This is a age uke.、Yeah? But you, know, you think, oh, why do we do four age uke? It's actually it's not four age uke. The first one is the only age uke. The next one s h o w you this technique could be strike into the chin, hook punch,、yeah? or hitting the nose. And that's why it's important. That's why they repeat it three times. So don't get trapped with the terms. Yeah? 
Then my question, <coughs> I don't know, we know Shotokan, okay? Gedanbarai is like this, okay? Soto uke is like this. Age uke is like this, yeah? W why do they do that? Uh, standardization, yes, it is a standardization, but uh, why do we stick the hand? Why do we stick this hand? It's easy to teach big and then make it small. Like oh, the large motion, okay. I can do large motion. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought you to pull them into the Ah, the pulling, yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, you know, possible bunkai. Uh, actually... Judge this thing? My <laughs> 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 That's what the white belt do. <laughs> uh, it's actually, <coughs> it's teaching you secretly that hand is the block and this hand is attack. Yeah, just like he and uh, P and Nidan or he and Shodan. Block and this is strike. This is either punch to get or blocking punch, right? You know, teki, right? Boom, boom. You know this movements. So this one is this soto nagashi uke. So instead of this is going to be soto uke this way, it's uke here, striking opponent, then striking again. Yeah, which uke is same thing. Make two movements to do the block. No, it's not two movements. It's a punch is coming. You blocking, then striking. Yeah. So it looks like a uchi uke, but it actually isn't. It's a block and the strike. Because Okinawan people, you know, they practice this for Budo. They don't take two movements to make one technique. It's one movement. Okay, so if there is a two, then there is a second meaning. You know, for instance, in Kanku Sho, when Kanku Sho, when you land, mm -hmm. and then you go into Uchiuke, mm -hmm. um, is the leading hand still there? That, that blocking hand still there? Or do you just go straight in? You know, because do those differences, show, do you see those differences in some of the cases? Yeah, cases? as you become advanced, you should use only one hand. Yeah, because here I showed on time, one, two, yeah. But it's actually, you don't need this unless you're going to do the blocking. Yeah, so actually it's straight into this movement. Yeah, just one. But when you teach beginners and intermediate, you have to explain. We call this fufute. Fufu in Japanese means uh, married couple. Both, <laughs> both hands have to work together. Fufute. F U F U T E. Fufute. Meaning married couple hands. Yeah, meaning both hands have to work, uh, you know, because here Shoda is, or Pinya Nida is the only one, the one technique, one arm, okay? But you know, ahe and nidan, or pin and shodan, like this, both hands goes up. And a lot of times says, this is, you know, jodan, which you get, and this is kamae. No, it's wrong. <laughs> They're not gonna just kamae, no. This is the block, this is the hitting, right? So probably story you, you practice correct idea. But in a shodogan, they teach, punch is coming, this is waiting. So that, you know, like the next one punch comes and you catch his arm <laughs> like, <laughs> like this and punch. No, it's not that, you know, difficult thing. It's just punch, block it, punch. And it's a nagashuken and punch, right, in the punch. So it's uh, simpler, you know, more, makes more sense. So both hands work together to do, both hands do the things, not like come one question about Shotokan blocks. All blocks like Sotokyo, this arm is big hand close, but specific in, in RUK, they open this hand. Exactly, because I they told you the correct this. one. No, 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 because in the kata, yeah. is preserved the correct idea, blocking. Yes. So everything should be open <coughs> if it's, you know, just holding. But the open, close meaning there is a technique to it. So if you do Jiyang, yes, you open also. Jiyong again is to you know practice by Shodan Nidan people, but that's a basic kata. And uh, make uh, all those katas are all basic. That's why Asai Sensei brought hundred more katas, right? That are more advanced and and uh, 
we did not do any kata because we just don't have enough time. But we have very good kata. Which most of the time is just one arm movements instead of using this. So it's, it's like, if you go back to Okinawa, you do, right? It's, I'm sure that teacher tell you it's straightforward. It's not going to do one, two movements to make one technique. This has meaning, like a blocking and striking. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Okay? I don't think those masters are that stupid to say, coming one, two. It takes too much time. Do you think there can uh, be a, a danger that you learn too many kata and you don't learn <coughs> the, the bunkai for the kata? Um, and so maybe you maybe know 40 kata, but the bunkai understanding is just not there. Correct. And uh, do you sort of become a kata collector almost <laughs> rather? Exactly. Um, exactly. And uh, what do you think uh, maybe? Uh, sort of need and sand and uh, should the, you know the, how many katas should uh, with bunkai should they really understand? I mean, I've heard quotes of sensei saying you know there was there were schools in, in the old days where they just practiced one kata for five um, years. Or yeah, when I started, they told me we practiced one kata for five years. Yeah. That's after Brahmas, okay? Uh, Heian was like a, like every six months, you know, you advance. But when you become black belts, okay, you do Basai Dai for five years. Then we teach you Kanka Dai, five years. That's the kind of concept they had, right? Yeah, so it's a good argument. You know, it is better to have only few that you really master, including Bunkai, or practice a lot of Kata. And Asai style is going for more Kata, okay? Meaning, again, who are the practitioner, right? The people who practice only twice a week? Try to learn 50 katas? No, that doesn't make sense, right? But if there are some people practicing five hours a day, every day, well, maybe they can do, you know, 50 katas. So, depends how you do the kata. If you just do kata, just looking pretty, then it's not budo anymore. It's, it's a karate dance, I call it, right? Karate dance, looking pretty, no meaning. So it has to have a meaning. As you're doing the technique, you, you need to know in your head you're blocking this time or striking, right? The same movements, you know, like a pinyan sandan. Like, you know, what the hell is this? <laughs> Somebody's going to punch like this. It doesn't make sense. So you got to think what it is. Yeah, blocking and then this is a strike. Yeah, same time. So if you understand that and if you're ready for it's okay to have many katas, but again, you have to master. And as I sense, his idea was in each kata, in the JK, not to look down, but most of them are, are bigger, um, elementary, entry level kata. So you have to have more of uh, uh, unsu, uh, kankusho, and the super rinpei kind of kata, yeah? And for the advanced people, like talking about sandan, yondan, yeah? So that's why he introduced many more katas into. And by practicing those kata, they have different techniques, you know? So uh, uh, it, it may not be the direct answer because it depends who is practicing, but whether you practice only five or 20, you have to practice with knowing the use, bunkai. Yeah, if you have time, you should do and expand yourself, right? Because if you're trapped on, like, a, um, a Motobu Sensei, right? He's famous. Uh, some people say he only knew, you know, Naifanchi, Tekki, ne? But he, he knew the other ones, but he said Naifanchi is one of the most important kata. But you gotta know different katas to, to learn different techniques, right? Right. Okay. All right. Okay. Last three steps. <laughs> they were added because here again, the tournaments, you have to come back to where you started. Okay? So you start here, you finish here. Oh, okay? 
So that's what it means. Only on, on this end. Yeah, because what punkai can you do? <laughs> they say, oh, jumping on the rocks <laughs> backwards? I will never do that. <laughs> jumping on rocks. <laughs> You're crazy. But missing techniques that they saw some dangerous. I don't think so, because if you study the Okinawan kata, they have the similar kata. They finish right here. Yeah, in chinte. Yeah, the end. Finish instead of. <laughs> it's in my book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Buy this book. She's selling. <laughs> okay. Yes, I wrap up. I have one more thing. When you do kumite or bunkai, okay, and especially the shotokan, we do two tempo. We call tempo, which is punch comes. One, two. This is two tempo, right? Just like a one, two. That is an option, but that's the worst option you can have. Too slow. I mean, the guy is going to be here as a waiting until you're going to punch, okay? Because the guy could probably punch you the second punch faster than your gyakuzuki, right? So that's two punch, which is okay for the beginners because they have to understand the block, they have to understand the counter punch, right? But as you go up higher, I want to see the most, you know, practitioner would do 1.5, which is you block, and this is the hand you're going to use. This is faster because the distance is close. From here, farther, closer, right? This direction, block and here, get on by punch. Okay? So block, punch with the same hand, we call 1.5. It's not really a, a time, you know, 1.5, but the point is shorter than two. 1.5. Then what is one? One is you block and punch at the same time. Yeah? Same time come, same time come, right? Same time come. Okay? And this is so, yeah, block, punch. You already have this in a kata. This is very advanced. Yeah? You block and punch at the same time. And advanced people should be doing that more. Then there is a 0.5. Okay, point five meaning before the opponent finish. This is a one, right? So before the opponent is here, in other words, a punch is coming, and that's the time you want to punch. That's point five before the he commits the technique. Di. Huh? Di. Next one is di zero when the opponent boom. That's a di. Yeah, zero. That's the best. But the problem is. Oh, he hit the guy, the other guy did not do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Overprotection, yeah. But the timing is, that's what the karate in sente nashi, right? Then there is a contracting saying sente hisho. Yeah, sente hisho means if you go fa first, you always win. Then the other one says, from Agoshi Sen says, karate ni sente nashi. There is no first attack in karate. So it says, these two contradict each other. And that's what it means. Yeah? You don't instigate, but when the guys fight, you're already there before he moves. Zero point. That's the ultimate. Well, it's not really ultimate. There is a minus point, but I'm not <laughs> going to into that. <laughs> you, if you read, no. You, <laughs> yeah, you, you learn how to read a key, but this is the, you know, not really. This is really there, but we're not going to go into that. You can read the brain waves, right? So you can detect when he thinks he's going to. So it's even before he moves, you can, you can do it. But that's a little beyond, so we're not going to talk about it. So zero point and the point 0.5, one, one and a half, and two. Okay, so those are one different. One and, a half. one and a half is block and use the same, same uh, you know, the same thing, the blocking with this one and kick in the same time. You know, block here. So uh, kick or the, use the same tool to do two techniques, blocking. The army he was doing this very often, blocking it. Right, right. So that's advanced, but then advanced like Sanda Yongdan people has to go into the same time. Yeah, attack and counter same time. Because other, otherwise, even 1.5, if the opponent is quick, he, his uh, gyakuzuki could be fast, right? But same time, then when he's finished, the counter is in. So he cannot do the second attack. But you want to stop, right? Second attack.
Okay. All right, I'm wrapping up. <laughs> Any question? One more question. If not, can we go? Yes, we can go. <laughs> Please buy the book right here. We only have how many? About five more um, books. Seven. I will seven. Seven. Eight. How much? At we no need? cost. <laughs> you can just present your books before we uh, go to the if anybody wants to have your books, maybe they can get those now. No, seriously, yeah, if you yeah. do, please see Lourdes here. I have some yeah, still. Some, so. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. <laughs>